No other writer for Thomas has had a journey quite like Michael White. From starting out as a Thomas fan, to actually becoming a writer for the show, to being the only crew member who wrote for the reboot, literally nobody else had an experience with Thomas quite like Michael White. In a time where the Thomas series was at its absolute worst, Michael's episodes were always the ones that everyone looked forward to the most, and were really the only ones that were ever discussed in the fandom. So today, we're going to go through the full story of Michael's time with Thomas. We're going to break down the full story of him working for the show and try and understand why it is about his episodes that fans love so much. This will hopefully be a new series on the channel called Writer Review, where I take a particular writer from Thomas and review all their episodes. I originally wanted to tackle some of the bigger writers first, like Sharon Miller or Andrew Brenner before covering Michael, but I soon changed my mind on that, and you'll understand why at the end of the video. So let's begin. As I've already said, Michael had a previous history with the fandom. Michael started his YouTube channel, White House Films, 14 years ago. Some of you watching this video might not have even been born. That's how long ago this was. He mostly posted videos on his Farquhar layout and his series Miniature Railway Adventures. Funnily enough, I actually remember watching one or two of his videos before he became a writer for Thomas. Michael started out as a writer for the TV show Pablo. Pablo was a show designed with autistic children in mind, and this show was spearheaded by by none other than Andrew Brenner, the same head writer who wrote for Thomas. In order to write on Pablo, we wanted to put together a team that had the experience, that were on the spectrum, and who could bring that experience into the writing process directly. Brenner took a liking to Michael's work, commenting that his scripts were unlike any of the others. The way Michael was very descriptive with the scenes was unlike any of the other scripts for the show. My first script for Pablo, like I spent the first paragraph literally writing the whole surroundings and the atmosphere. I think that was kind of what Andrew liked about my writing. He said he kind of reflected that old storybook style. Brenner saw real potential in Michael White. So so much so that he would later offer him a job on Thomas. Michael said yes for the job, and just like that, he went from Thomas fan to Thomas writer. While this was great for Michael, he was also incredibly scared of what the fandom might think of his episodes. As Thomas fans, we sometimes forget that there are still humans behind these episodes, and I think that's something that fans should keep in mind. When Michael came onto the crew, one of the first questions that Brenner asked him was, which character would he like to write for? Andrew Brenner asked me when I started, he says, right, which character do you want to write about? And I says, can I write about Edward, please. And he's like, yeah, sure. I don't think, think there's a way we can incorporate him in. Let's see what we what you can come up with. I just find it so funny because this was the same season where Edward had been written out of the main cast, so it would have been very easy for Brenner to say no. So I love the fact that despite everything that was going on at the time, Brenner was still willing to help Michael write an Edward episode. The fact that Michael is even a writer on Thomas at all, we owe to Andrew Brenner. We should remember that. Interestingly, An Engine of Many Colours was in fact not the first episode written by Michael White. The first was actually Hunt the Truck. Hunt the Truck, though it was the second of your episodes, Ed, was actually the first one that was written. Yes, it was the first one I came up with. We can presume that the episodes were just swapped around in production or something. I don't know. It's actually quite a common thing. I kind of love the fact that An Engine of Many Colours was the first Michael White episode we saw. Just because of how off the wall it is compared to everything else he's written. I definitely think An Engine of Many Colours is the most big one world big adventures-esque episode he's ever written. The pacing is all over the place, there's constantly something new happening every three seconds, and it isn't really a structured story. There was just so much the story had to cram into seven short minutes, and I think that's the episode's biggest issue. For those who don't know, the running time for series 22 had been changed from 8 minutes and 44 seconds to a clean seven minutes. While the shorter length definitely benefited some episodes, like Hunt the Truck for example, I think an engine of many colours would have definitely benefited from having the older running time. Because An Engine of Many Colours is essentially three episodes combined into one, with a running time of seven minutes, yeah, the pacing is going to be all over the place. The best example of this is in the opening sequence. No joke, it takes 23 seconds to get to the crash. Take that versus A Shed for Edward, where the setup for the crash was done in like one minute and seven seconds into the episode. I definitely think this episode would have worked better with a longer running time, especially when you consider that the episode takes place in series 21. I like that they gave a story to James dealing with a crash from series 21, because since that season got cut short, that subplot felt a little glossed over to me, so it was nice to see them build off that again, even though it didn't really feel that necessary. There's lots of really clever setups and payoffs in this one too. I love the detail of the steamworks running out of red paint. I'm sorry boss, but I can't find any more red paint. 
because Rosie and Bulgy had recently been repainted red, so it makes sense that they would have run out of red paint. I love the line that Thomas says at the beginning is paralleled with James at the very end. It doesn't matter what colour paint you have, James. It's what you do to be really useful that matters. It doesn't matter what colour I am. It's what I do to be really useful that matters. I love the turntable being a colour wheel. I like the callback to series one with James being painted blue. I like how Michael sets up Spencer being silver in the blue dream, Stanley being silver in the green dream, and then it pays off with James becoming silver in the third dream. A lot of really clever setups and payoffs. You get a sense that a lot of care was taken with this script. I think An Engine of Many Colours might be the second most divisive Michael White episode just after the Royal Engine. The story kind of falls apart for me as soon as we get to the Silver Dream though. That's where things just sort of start happening for the sake of happening. Like, why did James jump that hill? Why is Diesel here? What is Diesel meant to represent? I understand what Thomas and Rosie represent, but why is Diesel here? <laughs> why is Philip showing up? I think the reason Michael's other episodes worked better was because there was a certain level of rules and restrictions that he could follow that would help inform the story. But since the majority of this episode takes place in a dream sequence, because none of the rules in the dream are set down, it sort of causes the story to feel all over the place. The episode did ultimately feel redundant since the majority of it was just in a dream. But at the same time, I think that's a very base level way of looking at it. The episode is more of a character study about James rather than anything else. It asks the question, is James vain because of his red paint? Or is James vain because of his inherent character? Would James be the same character if he was painted blue or green or silver. It's very much an episode about the nature versus nurture argument. A lot of very interesting character stuff in this one. While it's a very poorly paced and completely off the wall episode, the actual stuff in the episode exploring James's psychology is very interesting. And I think that's why a lot of people say it's their favourite James episode, since it is a fundamental breakdown of the character. I remember the first time when An Engine of Many Colours was airing on Milkshake. I was shocked to see a new writer for the series. Then I was even more shocked to learn that the writer was in fact someone from the fandom. It was a complete shock. Michael had been keeping this a secret in the fandom for well over a year and a half. I kept the secret for a year and a half and I didn't tell anybody apart from like friends. Apparently Michael was really scared of what the fandom was going to say about this episode. I was very scared on the day of the broadcast. In fact, from the very beginning when Andrew offered me the job, I was very scared of the feedback of the fan base. But then when the episode eventually came out, the response was so positive that it actually caused him to well up and cry. Seeing all the comments from the feedback from the fans, I was so moved, literally. I was in tears because I was so moved by all the, the positive feedback to it because I was literally really scared. But yeah, I was very moved by the positive feedback and I thank everybody for welcoming me on board. We don't normally think about the people behind the scripts and the episodes. You might not realize it, but what you say online is actually very important. Really? Now, Hunt the Truck is the golden standard for a Michael White story. And I'm just going to say it, I think Hunt the Truck is Michael White's best episode. With every other episode he's written, there's always been some disagreement about the story or characters or general plotting. But this is the only Michael White episode that everyone unanimously agrees is a pretty damn good episode. I really love how we get to see this little prologue of Nia hunting for the truck before we get the title drop. It's a really clever way of hooking the viewer in before getting into the episode. He did a similar thing with Heart of Gold and the Royal Engine as well. It's a really unique thing to his scripts and I feel it helps make his episodes feel even more unique. This scene with Nia and Edward is also really clever. Keep in mind, this was the season where Edward had been written out of the show and Nia essentially replaced him. So I love the fact that the first scene that Michael wrote for the Thomas and Friends series was a scene showing Nia and Edward sort of coexisting in the same universe. This is how you integrate Nia, not like this, like this. But that's a video for another day. So Bill and Ben are hiding trucks on the others, and so to teach them a lesson, Edward hides their trucks. It's nice to finally see Bill and Ben have one of their pranks played on them, and it's so cool seeing Edward and the twins together again in CGI, because despite Bill and Ben being in CGI for over five years, for some reason they never got a chance to speak with Edward. So it's cool that we finally get to see them together in an episode, it's just brilliant. The way that Edward manipulates the whole situation and guilts Bill and Ben is so 
funny. It's one of the funniest episodes ever, which is especially helpful by the voice acting. Nobody can find trucks better than me! <laughs> I think this might be Edward's best appearance in the entire show, honestly. Yes, I do mean that. We get to see his kind side, we get to see him be cross, we get to see him be cheeky, he's manipulative, he's clever and cunning. We get to see every side to Edward's character in this one. The only side we don't see of him is being weak or vulnerable, and I am a-okay with that. Just to see Edward be so dynamic was just amazing. It just amazes me how well the pacing of this episode works. I describe it as brisk. It's not too quick and it's not too slow, and I think the new seven minute runtime really helps the pace of this one. A lot of the pacing in the CGI series can feel very drawn out and slow, so I really like the new seven minute running time that they started using in the CGI series. The pacing is just perfect. Every character's action feels earned and makes sense. The story is structured perfectly and is, in my humble opinion, the best Michael White episode, hands down. It's literally the only one that everyone can agree upon. <laughs> Now, for some reason, they only gave Michael two episodes in series 22. I guess they were just testing the water with him since he was a relatively new writer at the time, but they must have really liked him since they gave him double the episodes for series 23. Hell, they even gave him a season opener, so the new crew must have really liked his work. Free the Roads felt like it was straight out of the Brenner era. When Bulgy shows up, it was a huge shock. Everyone was wondering what they were going to do with him, and then he just didn't show up again for like two seasons. So like, what was the point? Thankfully, Michael White understood this and wanted to right that wrong. I love that they actually explain why Bulgy was back. It really helps with the continuity of his last appearance. The fat controller brought you back to help me. I love the idea of giving Bulgy exactly what he wants, but then having it screw him over. It's a nice little allegory of be careful what you wish for. I love the Batman sequence. That whole fantasy sequence feels so inspired, especially with the Robin reference with Bertie. Great steaming radiators, Bulgy. The way the way Bulgy blushes when the woman kisses him is so cute. The comedy for this one was pretty great. However, there are some things I find odd, like why are Bulgy and Bertie suddenly best friends? I thought Bulgy hated Bertie. I know Bertie. He's too small in size to be of any use. I guess over the years of being on Sodor, Bulgy eventually warmed up to Bertie, I guess? I don't know. Also, Bulgy didn't really mean to contaminate the water. It just sort of worked out that way. It just felt a little contrived. Also, apparently because Bulgy contaminated this one water tower, suddenly all the engines got contaminated too. Like, really? Did all the engines just happen to use that one water tower? Eh, it was a bit contrived, but sometimes you need a little bit of contrivance to move a story along. Overall, despite my nitpicks, Free the Roads had loads of great character moments and set pieces. There's lots of little details, like how Thomas turns green like he did in the hit era, or actually seeing Bulgy be taken by the rails, very ironic. And I actually think the updates on Bulgy and Bertie don't look half bad. Honestly, out of all the episodes in series 23, it's the only one I ever bother rewatching. That and maybe Heart of Gold too. Speaking of which, Heart of Gold was the other token Michael White episode of the season. Much like Hunt the Truck, I love the opening prologue of this one. It really creates a sense of intrigue and mystery as to who these two men are. It really helps the episode feel more cinematic. I think that's how I describe Heart of Gold. This episode feels like the most cinematic Michael White white episode, even more so than the Royal Engine if I'm being honest. All the dynamic shots of Toby, the setups and payoffs, it all really helps make this feel greater than any of the other stories. The concept of having Toby work in the museum felt so inspired, it almost feels like a sequel to that hit era episode Toby feels left out, where Toby thinks he's going to be put in a museum. Maybe the fat controller has decided to put me inside the museum. But what is great about Heart of Gold is that it doesn't just tell you why Toby is great, it actually shows you. It's a pretty great episode and definitely one of the most streamlined ones he's ever written. Hell, Thomas doesn't even make a cameo in this one. That's how laser focused the story was. So many things pay off really well in this episode. The opening prologue sets up the thieves, then you realize it's the thieves when they walk here, then they point at the old push trolley, which pays off here. Diesel being rude to Toby pays off at the end. Really? And I love the continuity of the thieves trying to steal King Godred's crown. Very clever. I love it. <laughs> I think when people talk about Heart of Gold, their first instinct is to usually talk about how weak and pathetic Toby was. And that's a big shame because one of the main reasons Michael wrote this episode was because he was sick of that. I really wanted to do an episode about Toby because I just felt like he needed a good episode. Because some of the previous episodes I'd seen, he was often portrayed as people thought, oh, he's old and useless and out there. But I just thought to myself, well, maybe he isn't really. 
I think it's a shame that people tend to only focus on the sad and depressed part of the episode because it's not the full picture. We need to see this scene of Toby being belittled by the passengers in order to make the climax feel more impactful. If Toby just showed up to the castle guns blazing and was a badass straight out of the gate, that would be cool and all, but it wouldn't have the heart. The whole point of the story is that it's easy to judge Toby based on his appearance, which doesn't reflect the heart of gold on the inside. It's honestly such a powerful message. I totally get why people don't like seeing sad, depressed Toby in this one, but that's completely ignoring how cool and badass he is in the third act. The way he calls to the thieves and then goes after them without a moment's hesitation. They've got the crown! I am stop them, sir! So satisfying. People generally like this one, but it's not really talked about that much. Which is a shame because I might even go as far to say it's the most underrated Michael White episode in the batch. Also in series 23, we got some lesser Michael White episodes. Not to say that they're bad episodes or anything, but I definitely feel like Free the Roads and Heart of Gold were the episodes that Michael wanted to write about more, while Out of Sight and Deep Trouble definitely felt like the episodes he was asked to write about. I think Out of Sight is probably my least favourite Michael White episode. Not to say it's bad or anything, it's just one of those confusion plots, where the characters in the story don't know certain information, so you're just waiting around for them to realise. So so Brenda likes a nice clean work site so she keeps moving all the stones but then the pack think the stones are going missing or something, I don't know. It just feels a little uninspired. I'm fine with confusion plots as they're usually used as vehicles for comedies but I don't know, I feel like a lot of the comedy kind of fell flat in this one. There were so many odd choices made with this one, like why were Jack and Alfie and Oliver bringing stones over to the site? Surely it would have made more sense for Max and Monty to do that. There are some things that I liked in the episode. Episode. Like that scene in the pack's yard. Even if it's a retextured set, I still think it was cool seeing it. Since this was the only time it was ever seen in CGI, I think. I like that they gave Brenda a lead role, since this is her only episode as a lead. However, I do have to question why they even bothered making her one, since she didn't even have any merch besides a single sticker toy. Yeah. <laughs> I like that they gave Miss Jenny a Northern Irish accent. Everybody has to be able to use the site and do their jobs, Brenda. For those I don't know. Voices in this part of Ireland sound like this. Well, voices in this part of Ireland sound like this, don't I? So I find it so cool that they actually bothered to give Miss Jenny a unique Irish accent. We are completely and totally innocent and this is a horrific miscarriage of justice. Which, funnily enough, is the same accent that Michael White has. Was this like an intentional reference to Michael White or something? Something to think about. The other pack episodes that Michael wrote was Deep Trouble and, in my opinion, was way better. Unlike Out of Sight, this one actually feels like a pack episode from Thomas. Like how the opening is Thomas bringing Jack and Alfie to the site. Nice reference. Speaking of which, there's a really clever, subtle character growth moment here with Thomas when he talks about falling down to the mine. Sorry, but I can't. The last time I was here, I fell into a mine shaft. I'm still not sure if the ground is strong enough. Michael had often talked about how he liked to show off Thomas's growing arc. Characters evolve. I mean, we all evolve over time. Thomas has evolved over these many years so I think it's just sometimes I, I would maybe like to show a bit more of that little uh, evolvement that Thomas is slowly growing up like he's slowly he, he can still be cheap but he shows like he's growing up in a way. So I love this line so much because it just shows how much Thomas has grown as a character from series one. I love that he learned from his old past mistakes. It was also super satisfying to see Max and Monty finally get their comeuppance. They've done stupid things before but never something this serious. It's really interesting to see how they would act in crisis. And I love that the team tries to get them out as well. Even though Max and Monty got what they deserved, I do think it's sweet that they still tried to help them. Monty may have dissipated the danger flags, but we'd never leave even a naughty lorry behind. Also, I loved how they used Darcy in this one. They set her up at the beginning having this feud with Max and Monty, but then they just forget about her until the third act. It really says a lot about Darcy's character that despite Monty being rude to her, she was still willing to help him in the end. And it's one of the few times I genuinely believe that Max and Monty were sorry. 
While I liked that Michael did a pack episode, part of me wishes that we'd just gotten two more stories about the trains, as I definitely feel like these episodes dragged down his reputation. I feel like the man had so many other stories he could tell. A lot of his episodes definitely feel like doing stories that hadn't been done before, like giving Edward, Bill and Ben an episode in CGI, or giving Bulgy or James episodes that they should have had in series 21, giving Brenda an episode, giving Max and Monty a proper arc. That's my favourite thing about his episodes. The fact that these episodes felt important to the story. The only character he didn't really get around to in my book was Henry, but I'll talk more about that later. <laughs> So in order to talk about Michael's final three episodes, we first need to talk about the context of the situation. So for series 24, Andrew Brenner, the man who got Michael White the job on Thomas, stepped down as head writer for the series. Because uh, it was the first time we, that he wasn't uh, with us on the, on the team. Series 24 would be the first time that Michael would be working without Andrew Brenner as a guide. Since it was the 75th anniversary of the Railway series, the crew wanted to do something very special. So Michael White was given the anniversary special and Michael got into a bit of a panic. He turns to me and he says, uh, Michael, we want you to write the episode. And I was like, what? What? He's like, yeah, he's, he's like, we want you to write the episode. I'm like, okay, okay. Uh, no pressure, no pressure. And I was thinking to myself, oh my God, what is going on here? So I was panicking really. He was worried that he wouldn't be able to write something as good as the adventure begins. So much so that he called up Andrew Brenner for advice. When I got back from the workshop, the first thing I did was I called Andrew because it was the first time we, that he wasn't with us on the on the team. And I called him and I says, Andrew, they asked me to write the 75th anniversary. Oh, but congratulations. No, Andrew, no, I'm freaking out. Why? What's wrong? How the hell am I going to top the adventure begins? That's the best special. I just find it so sweet that despite Andrew Brenner not even working for the series anymore, he was still willing to give Michael White advice and help him during a panic attack. I don't know what to do. And he's like, calm down, just go and just do what you do what you normally do. Just just write what you think is best. And I was like, what did you do that make this that that special so good? I says, who helped you? The Reverend Audrey. But Andrew, this is a whole original idea. And he's like, just calm down, just do what you normally do. And I'm like Okay, no pressure. He was still willing to give Michael White advice. It's honestly really sweet, and it just makes me respect Andrew Brenner even more. Andrew and Michael must have had a really strong relationship. Andrew Brenner really was a great leader to Michael. So The Great Little Railway Show was the first episode that Michael wrote for Series 24, and the episode is interesting to say the least. It's one of the only episodes where all three gauges on the island are seen together. So you get the standard gauge engines, you get the miniature gauge engines, and you get the Scarlowy engines, which is cool. The fact that the Scarlowy engines are featured so much, I think is Michael's way of trying to give them something to do, which is sweet. The episode is structured kind of weirdly though. It starts out with Percy, but then he just sort of goes missing for the middle section of the episode, only to then show up at the end. Like really? We're, we didn't get to see a scene of him like a Brendam Docks or anything? I don't know, it felt kind of weird. A lot of the episode is just sort of jumping around from character to character. I think a lot more interesting things could have been shown in that middle section. Like, we don't really see Gordon not find Philip, we're just told it. We don't really see Henry not find Rosie, we're just told it. We don't see Bertie not find Thomas at Farquhar, we're just told. It definitely comes off to me as a novelty episode, more than anything. Like, oh, look at how cool it would be if we put all these characters uh, and they all met up at the one time. So yeah, it definitely feels like a novelty episode more than anything, although I will say, I really love how the episode pays respect to the Reverend's layout and models. I especially love seeing the children be shown how Thomas works. It really encourages young children to go to the real life steam railways and learn more about these engines. While it is a gimmicky episode, I won't deny that that ending is definitely very nice. It is a bit of a guilty pleasure if I'm being honest. The other Michael White episode this year was the Royal Engine. Now, out of all of Michael White's episode, the Royal Engine is by far the one that everyone sees seems to be most polarized on. Some people love it, some people hate it. I do like the Royal Engine, but at the same time, I do understand that it has flaws, and I'll get into them. I've actually gone into full detail about the Royal Engine and why I think it's great, so if you want to hear my further thoughts on that, I actually did a video ranking every finale. I'll link it here. I think the biggest flaw that everyone brings up with the Royal Engine is its pacing. Unlike all the other Michael White episodes, Michael used the 7 minute running time perfectly. I think all of Michael White's episodes are paced pretty perfectly. I feel like the story of the Royal Engine could have been told in about 10 or 15 minutes. I don't really feel like it needed to be 22, if I'm being honest. Although that being said, if the episode had only been 10 minutes long, I feel like the episode would have felt a little unspecial. So on the one hand, I am actually kind of glad that they made it 20 minutes long. There are so many sequences 
influences from the special that I love. The opening montage of Thomas and Topham getting ready is great. I love how they parallel each other, like how they both get brushed down, or how they both get washed, or how they both get their new attire on. Really sweet stuff. I love all of the traveling montages in this one. Seeing all the Journey Beyond Sodor sets again was great, although I do wish some of the sets didn't feel as bare. Like there's a lot of generic tree track green sets. Some of my favorite sets are the ones near the end where we get to see those very clever matte paintings that they did. But like the majority of it is just sort of generic green countryside. Of course that isn't really a Michael White problem whereas it is an ARC Productions problem. But anyway, I also really love the ending to this one. From the real life references to the Queen having railway series books. My son has been reading in the books written about it. Your Northwestern Railway is well known for helping out those in need. To Thomas and Topham getting their awards to just seeing Thomas come all the way to Victoria Station was really something special. Little engines can do big things! That was one thing that I kind of thought to myself whilst writing that. What does it be having heard Thomas say for a while? Little engines can do big things was one of those things I, I remembered. I thought, yes, we have to, I have to bring that back. However, there are some issues that I had with the structure. Like, Beresford didn't really add anything, if I'm being honest. He tells Thomas to go the wrong way, but like, they could have just cut out that and it still would have worked fine. Or Thomas getting lost in the woods or stopping at the station to meet Duchess like three times. Nothing really matters or affects the next scene. Hell, Thomas is fireman gets abandoned and it's just never touched upon again. Like, how many times does Thomas need to get mucked up? I think there could have been a better way of having the events of the story all come together in the end. As it stands, the only time that anything really paid off in the special was Duchess's safety valve being burst. But I feel like I'm being a bit negative here, and as I already said, I went into more detail about the positives in my other video. But for what the episode is and what it represents, I really like it. It's been nearly three years since the Royal Engine has come out, and I think time has been pretty nice to the Royal Engine. I know many fans who hated it when it first came out and have since come to appreciate it. In fact, Michael White even did a charity interview where he talked about the making of the episode, and that's where a lot of the interview clips from this video actually come from. I bring this up because I thought it was very sweet that he actually wanted to donate to the Northern Ireland charity for children with autism. I just thought that was very sweet. I am so glad that the Royal Engine is the finale to the original series. It's not a perfect episode, but considering the quality of the series at that point, I'm just glad that we got a nice Michael White episode as the series ending. For many, the Royal Engine was the end to Thomas. However, it wouldn't be the last time we've seen Michael White as a writer. This is the part where I talk about All Engines Go. So yeah, that elephant in the room. When the All Engines Go reboot happened, all the original crew from the old Thomas series were replaced. New writers, new animators, new voice actors, new everything. <laughs> So when I first seen on Twitter that Michael would be writing an episode for the series, I literally thought it was an edit, but it turned out he actually did write for the series. So for the first time, I'm going to be talking about All Engines Go. <laughs> so let's dive in. I honestly don't know what's more shocking. The fact that Michael White, a fan, became a writer, or the fact that an old team member wrote for All Engines Go, or the fact that it was the same man who did it. It's just funny to me how things like that work out. So in the episode, Nia's Surprising Surprise, it follows Nia on her anniversary of arriving on Sodor. And straight away, I really like the concept. It honestly feels like a story Michael had for the older series. I think the episode is very similar to Don't Tell Thomas, where all the engines are keeping a big secret, but the engine thinks that nobody cares for him or her, only to be surprised at the end. Yeah, it's a pretty standard episode if I'm being honest. I'd say Michael was a lot more restrained when writing for All Engines Go, although there was one reference to the series where Nia mentions that her and Thomas met on this hill. Hey, this is where we first met, remember? All those years ago, I helped you up this very hill. Which confuses me since doesn't that mean that Thomas didn't meet Nia in Kenya? So they did meet on this hill, but it just was on Sodor? What is canon? Although I will admit that the scene at the end where Nia realizes that all of her friends care for her, I will admit that I did well up a bit. I didn't outright cry or anything, I mean, it wasn't that emotional, but I did find myself getting misty-eyed, there was something very sweet about it. I think the middle chunk of the episode is the most nothing. I think most of it could have been cut out if I'm being honest, and it really wouldn't have mattered. <laughs> Honestly, I think I would have preferred it as a CGI episode if I'm being honest. I think the seven minute running time would have made for a much more interesting story. I don't think it's the best All Engines Go episode, but it is certainly up there. I mean, I would have to have actually seen all the episodes in order to make that call, but for what it is, 
I like it. I really wish that Michael would write more episodes for All Engines Go. Similar to his work on Pablo, where he voiced act for the series and consulted on the autistic characters, I really wish that Michael had stayed on the All Engines Go production team. I mean, he did also do a bit of consulting on Bruno, and with the history he had on Thomas and Pablo, having him on the production team seems like a no-brainer. It's pretty clear to me that Michael had way more ideas for Thomas than what we actually seen. Even some of his old Thomas concepts would be really cool to see in All Engines Go. Take the hint, Mattel. Take the hint. So yeah, those were the Michael White episodes. As I said, no other person had a journey quite like Michael White. He started out as a fan for Thomas and then became a writer for the official show and then became the only person with the original series to write for All Engines Go. <laughs> From raising money for autistic charities, to consulting on autistic characters like Bruno, to writing some of the best content out of the entire Big World Adventures era, Michael White was truly one of the best writers in all of Thomas. We owe Michael so much. He was truly one of the greatest gifts that the fandom was ever given. And on this date, July 19th, Michael White's birthday, I want you all to wish Michael White a very happy birthday. Thank you, Michael White, for being such a great writer and for creating some of the best stories that the series has ever known. This one is for you.